way, and they're going to be very confident going into the next games. Slew, and you can only pick one this time. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> I, I, I have to go with uh, Omega Snipe on this one. I'm going to have to agree with Jack here. All right, Jack and Slew haven't had enough betting on Omega Snipe. Let's see what happens if we get to the game. Hi, Jack. Hi, Slew. And we're back in <laughs> EOA now. I mean, we already kind of got a sneak preview of this yesterday, certainly with Team Omega Snipe. For those who weren't watching, we'll expect to see them go on a more unconventional route over to the right side after they deal with Parjish. Actually, maybe re even right off the bat. But I'm pretty sure both teams will deal with Parjesh first, and then they're actually going to go over to King Deepbeard before that. But uh, first, all eyes on this first pull. Yeah, at this point, we're going to be seeing, you know, the, the skips that you're going to be usually trying to get around to. The nice thing about uh, I have a Shara is there's so many different crab packs that you're able to just wind up and grab. So a lot of times you're trying to skip as many of the different uh, sea creatures regarding Parjesh here as best as you can, and then you're able to move on to more of kind of the open field where you're going to be able to round up as many crabs as possible to be able to nuke down. So both teams, you know, Pop and Bloodlust getting that first pack into Parjesh and being able to burn it down quickly. Certainly dealing a lot with Mr. Crabs today. Both teams, huge pull here indeed. Bloodlust come out, as you said, Jack. Now we just have to remind for those at home that we are dealing here with necrotic and skittish today necrotic being that stacking debuff on the tank that decreases the amount of healing taken and done by three percent per stack and skittish not one you're used to seeing in the mdi it decreases the tanks overall threat done so might make it a bit more difficult for some of these teams to do these huge pulls on this map and have the tank kite as they will be more prone to losing aggro but no problem here so far as both teams are not too far off of each other on the boss percentage goals trot is favorably in that 39 percent area and also being able to see, you know, where they need to be able to make those extra pulls, where they, and how well they're going to be able to have it. A lot of times you're seeing healers, for example, actually rounding up a lot of the crab packs. And because there w was so many concerns about threat generation, you were seeing, you know, different kinds of slows, uh, stuns being put down. That way you're actually able to get the tank in there, deal a little bit of damage, but then having a lot of the focus be on the range players to be able to do, deal the brunt of that DPS if you're not going to be able to have any kind of threat redirects or if the tank's just going to be dropping threat or losing threat to uh, any of the melee. Right, you are. Gulstrutters, now we do want to mention as well, Gulstrutters is slightly ahead on boss damage, but it's also on that percentage. I mean, it's not anything to scoff at too much right now, but that 9% can prove to be quite useful later on because there's just so many variants in packs that you can pull around the dungeon. Team Omega's now just approaching that 15% mark, but Gulstrutters looking strong and finishing Parjish off here as they start to move on into what is usually a fairly large pull after Parjish, but they've already done some of that large pull with the boss already, Jack. Yeah, and at that point, they're able to just kind of start working their way towards, you know, the, the future packs that are going all the way around. They're trying to make their way around the crushers here. They just take such a long time to be able to deal with. And in a lot of the ways, they're just trying to make sure they're getting around all of these. And again, as they're moving on towards Lady Hate Coil here, they do have to take care of two, uh, two of the Naga Enchantresses here in order to take down the shield. But at that point, a lot of times you'll be looking at seeing, because it is on a tyrannical setting, how they're able to clear trash, maybe even clear Serpentrix first before they're going to be go able to go on to Lady Hate Coil with Bloodlust. Serpentrix back from his knighting trip in England. <laughs> Team Omega Sniped, as we mentioned earlier, is actually moving over to the right side towards King Deepbeard, something that, honestly, I haven't really seen since Legion Beta, except for yesterday when they uh, attempted at it. Gold Strutters with a more conventional route, t uh, pulling that second Arcanist with a few of those goos, getting what they can together. And as you said, it's going to be interesting to see if they want to deal with Hate Coil or Serpentrix first. Lots of trash clearing coming up for both teams, and a lot of that plays around when do you want your bloodlust available yep definitely all eyes on omega sniped making sure that they get the execution here to be able to get through this cave they had some kind of errors uh going forward as they were trying to make sure that they were able to round up all these packs make sure that the tank has aggro uh, being able to get everything out of the way as the rest of the team wants to be able to kind of sneak by then be able to get the res out onto hadrian here and be able to start moving out onto deep beard that was one of the little errors just kind of losing out on some aggro uh having some of your other dps die not being able to make it out of the cave those are the big things that were really the downfall of the team early on so looking at the strong execution this is what you want to be seeing right now yeah i mean so really big pull coming out here from team omega snipe looks like they finally got the stealth that they wanted there's a huge trail of gilbins and murlocs on the left side of the screen there of course on top of those two giants so this is actually a massive pull coming out of team omega snipe certainly well beyond making up for that missing nine percent after parjish that they were had facing uh gulch trotters gulch trotters still moving around clearing some of the extra trash as you can see they're running around pulling some of these crabs right now team omega snipe well pulling this off in comparison to what we saw yesterday this is the team that they want to be in the what the pull that they wanted to show yesterday jack yeah and i was actually really surprised that they made sure that they pulled uh the, all of the gilbins with the giants here is usually a lot more dangerous of a pull uh, than you'd be wanting to see. But also just the patience for all the DPS, making sure that you know, aggro
aggro is getting established, making sure Hadran is going to be able to have everything that he needs to be able to get through that pathway there. And then at that point, getting everything in, stunning it, and making sure those uh, necrotic stacks aren't going up too high. So excellent execution here by Omega Sniped. And I'm not to be outdone, Gulls Trotters are the massive pull of their own as a huge amount of Gilbins, Crabs, and three Hydras are in there for Gulls Trotters right now. That's a lot of damage. Those Hydras as well cannot be slowed, much like a lot of the other mobs. So the tank has to play quite defensively here. As you can see, Skylar starting to kind of run over, making sure he drops his D&Ds, keeping as many blood boils and that blood plague up as possible. Chompy doing well here, as like we saw with Dr. J yesterday, to stand behind the tank. He will inevitably gain some of that aggro, but wants to make sure that it's kited in the same direction. Really well done here from both teams. But King Deepier has already been pulled for Team Omega Snipe. About this boss, you want to make sure that when you have these bubbles up on the screen on your players, that you're taking damage purposefully from the rings on the ground. You want to clear as much of that absorb as possible, otherwise it will explode for a tremendous amount of damage on the group. And of course, Jack, there is that quaking mechanic. Yeah, and very important with the quaking, uh, you will end up dropping just a little crack onto the earth here, which after a short period of time will just hit another aftershock. So you're able to actually stack all of your quakings onto the same position, but you will have multiple aftershocks. If you keep on stacking multiple quakes, they will be on the same spot. So make sure you're stacking your quakings onto one area and then moving out before the aftershock as you're seeing for Omega Snipe go out. King Deep, they're just going below 50% here. Gulf Strutters cleanly cleaning up the rest of the trash that they pulled in. Looks like they will be starting on our good friend Sir Pentrix in a moment as we see one of those evil seagulls ominously flying above the arena there. One of the advantages, of course, of dealing with Sir Pentrix for his pro, uh, instead of Lady Haycoil is you will not have those seagulls landing on the ground. So they don't have to worry too much about that right now as a few more of these crabs are pulled on top of the boss, benefiting some of that single target damage for the rogue. Yeah, and you're seeing Hadron's uh, Purgatory actually procking there as they're going on to Deep Beard's Enrage Effect. They've been holding on to a number of little Gilbins uh, for most of the encounter to make sure they're able to buff up Zongo's damage here. This is also very scary when you're having, you know, one of the hardest enraged parts or one of the most difficult parts of the fight while you're trying to hold on to multiple adds, stacking up those necrotics. So Hadron doing well to kind of get his distance here, start dropping his necrotic stacks and being able to kind of kite out the uh, little Gilbins there. And uh, the, the big, actually, the danger about that Skulker there is not just, the boss himself is not too dangerous here, but the Skulker actually adds stacks of 10% increased damage taken, stacking on the tank, which is why you saw Hadrian, not only for the necrotic stacks, start to kite away and be safer, but he wanted to get rid of those damage taken stacks as well, especially because that Purgatory is now gone. They do dip into the single target digits of health on King Deep Beard. Gulf Shutters has already started on Serpentrix, down into that second phase, and well cleaving the extra heads that spawn at 66 and 33% on this boss. Yeah. Doing very well to actually make sure they're dropping this solar beam on top of that blazing hydra there, you know, providing some extra little multi dotting opportunities. And once that falls off, then they're going to be able to focus it down and be able to take it down very rapidly here. So great target focus by Gulf Strutters, making sure that they're able to just take their time, get what they need uh, from any of the extra targets, and be able to cleave them down quickly. But Omega Sniped here, you know, in the instance that has you know made their namesake, is doing extremely well in their execution as they're moving on to Serpentrix room. And they're a little while they're a little bit behind on trash. This is going to be where they're going to start making everything up. This is the room that the huge pull of trash came from Gulch Trotter, so wouldn't be shocked to see something. You no, know, it's funny, they basically just had a reverse boat skip where they just kind of yeah. gradually fall down uh, that cliff there, uh, much to the dismay of some other teams before that. And we Gulch know how difficult the boat skip can be. The boat skip can be quite difficult, as we've seen yesterday. Big pull coming in here from Team Omega Snipe. Not as big as the one we saw from Gulch Trotters, as you can see. There's not as many Gilbin and uh, Crab Packs, and only two of the three Hydras, but they do have some extra trash already accomplished from that unconventional route through the cave. Gulch Trotters is now finishing off the last two heads that spawn with Sir Pentrix and working to finish off the boss himself. Yeah, and uh, as you're seeing all the extra hydras, I think they only pulled two hydras instead. You are seeing techniques going down on the side of Gulch Trotters here as around 17% left. It might have just been some aggro issues. You're seeing Dag has actually had a bunch of the uh, different crabs onto him that he's trying to make sure he's able to redirect into Skylark there, make sure he's able to get them all picked up and while they're able to just continue taking down some trash and getting a little bit extra single target damage to finish off the rest of the boss. But I also see that they're holding onto their battle res here right as they're about to get a second one available to them. So I'm not sure if they're just wanting to hold onto it for a Wrath of Ashar at the end if they're going to need to have battle reses there or something else coming up. Yeah, you know, I was looking at that too, and it, this was kind of a, a tough call. The boss wasn't too low enough to just kind of say, you know, we'll finish it off with four. They did certainly waste a bit of time here off in the four man the rest of this. They have about 30 seconds, 45 seconds left on their second battle res, but techniques will be rest here in a moment as Serpentrix successfully does go down. Team Omega Snipes already started on Serpentrix as well, but there's a huge trash differential between two teams, 32%. If I'm not mistaken. And, and we have Hadrian go down now. 
Yeah, Hadran had actually used his Purgatory already when we saw on Deep Beard, so they're doing well to get the Battle Res out very rapidly here, but it was quite a scary situation where so many of the Necrotic stacks were uh, up, he was actually not able to drop them in time to be able to get himself topped back off and receive any other kind of healing there, so at least they were able to get it up quickly, they weren't losing anybody else into the process in the process here. We are seeing on the side of Gulch Trotters with about 40 seconds left on Lust pulling into Haycoil here. Yeah, it's just, it's really dangerous. Those those five crabs that they pulled is, are, don't do much damage themselves, but that stacking necrotic, they can, it can really creep up on you as the tank. That's why you're seeing him more safely now kind of cunt, uh, kite in a circle around for the boss. Gulch Trotters now on Lady Haycoil at 80%. Yeah, and you're seeing actually just before Hadron died, he actually received freedom uh, from Luffy there. So I think it, what had happened was the crabs were just ended up slowing him and it's, he was trying to actually gain a little bit of distance. He just needed to have the freedom maybe a little bit earlier as he was engaging with them, get a bit more distance and kind of get out of the way and it looked like it was just something that wasn't quite anticipated on the side of Hadran and the rest of Omega Snipe, but it's not going to be too uh, too painful for them, really. Right, Jared Jack, those crabs do, of course, snapshot their um, root, essentially, or their snare on you, so you can't actually move out of range of them as the tank before it hits, so he unfortunately got snagged there, or chose perhaps on purpose to stay there just to get that extra threat because of the skittish modifier. Team Omega Snipe using their bloodlust here at 50% on Serpentrix. Gulch Trotter's now at 50% on Lady Hate Coil as well. Huge hit coming in. Techniques does go down he will be rezzed and up from the grass like a snake he comes and they will be dealing with the rest of these blobs as they kite around the room now similar to the other boss these blobs can be killed of course with the frontal on lady hay coil the biggest problem here is that once again they add necrotic stack so it's a bit of a double-edged sword here the tank's life is more difficult but you do gain single target damage on the boss yeah really having to make sure they're doing a great job of actually pulling away and there's so much movement on the side of gulch trotters to make sure he's able to you know, get some kind of distance so he's not having the necrotic stacks going up too high but also making sure that the team is able to quickly spread as you're seeing them doing right here making sure they're trying to stay away from the sandbars if possible during that focus lightning to make sure they're not destroying any of the sandbars here so when the static nova comes out they have a lot more areas uh, that will be safe for them to watch out for but also seeing you know any of the curses that are now falling off which the little blast that can knock players back and also destroy the GUIs. So it's always important to make sure that they're aiming it away from the GUIs and other players to make sure they can funnel in that more single target damage. These sandbars do have excellent mix drinks. Sir Pentrix now at 10% down for Team Omega Snipe. No problem there. They have cleared the heads and used their bloodlust. Jack, you did mention earlier very well that Gulch Trotters indeed has been holding on to that bloodlust right now. Likely to use it on Deep Yard, of course, at this point, or uh, Wrath of Ashar once they get access to it. Lady Haycoil successfully going down. One battle res on the... Uh, on the screen for both teams right now. Team Omega Sniped will be moving over to Lady Haycoil. Keep in mind, they have not killed her Arcanist yet, so she still needs to be freed before even being able to be engaged with. Also very interesting to see uh, Technics is going down once again as they were taking care of uh, Lady Haycoil there. It's also interesting to see that uh, Omega Sniped is looking to get maybe a third Bloodlust in before they're able to get the boss, or before they're able to get uh, to Wrath of Ashar here, so I'm kind of interested to be able to see if the timing is going to work out perfectly, where they got such an early bloodlust and they're going to be able to get it on cooldown immediately afterwards. That way they're going to be able to get it back onto Wrath of Ashar here, whereas Gulch Trotters is kind of accepting that they're going to be only having it when they're going to be going into Wrath of Ashar here, so it'll be interesting to see how they go here. You're also seeing Chompy going into his travel form, where he's going to be able to hold on to Dag. He quickly uses his Wild Charge to be able to jump up onto that platform, and then you're going to be able to see Dag hitting the Mass Res. You are able to individually transport everybody up there uh, there's a couple other little tricks with like shadow steps or uh, other little things like that but the easiest and maybe quickest way is to make sure that you're having everybody die get that mass res and kind of incurring some extra deaths yeah I don't know maybe hopefully the quickest way I mean that is an extra 10 seconds on the board plus the battle res uh, the mass res timer excuse me that needs to be incurred for that so I'm sure they know what they're doing they do move on to King Deep Beard at the moment pull the snail on the side of course they need it for that extra 2% you want to be approaching the final uh, boss uh, the enchantresses of course of the final boss with about 92% as they give you roughly 8% to finish your trash count for the dungeon so that's Snail will give them that 92% for Gulch Trotters on the right. Team Omega sniped dealing with, I believe, the second Arcanist at this point. They have a fair bit of trash lingering around. That Snail gives about 2 2.5% as well. But they still have a fair bit of trash to make up after this boss, so they can't just rush over right. Oh, I mean, they can rush over to yep. the Wrath of the Shard, but they will still need to pull some trash on top of it. Yeah, and also the, the positioning would be kind of interesting to see here as they are taking care of the last of these little globules before they are pulling into Hate Coil of where they're actually going to be grabbing a lot of their trash from because many of it is going to be back more towards Sir Pentrix's side, unless they're going to be grabbing some of the Gilbins, which actually looks like they're doing right now uh, with Hadran here. Previously, we had actually seen that they pulled the Gilbins into Hit Lady Haycoil as the uh, boss encounter started, but it actually, the last, uh, yesterday, it actually killed them uh, because the Hadran stacks get a little bit too high. He wasn't getting out of the way of any, any of the kind of roots, and the damage is stacked up too high for him to really deal with. So I'm expecting them to just pull everything into Haycoil here and start working on their execution a little bit better than last time. 
Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. And it is always scary pulling extra mobs with bosses on Necrotic. Ne Necrotic itself on most bosses isn't too dangerous, especially on Lady Hate Curl. You can kind of just run to one of these sandbars, as you call them, during her static shot, clean your stacks and come back in. But we'll have to see if they opt to keep the blue mobs alive, much like Gold Striders is. I'm going to vote with yes, as we see a huge amount of trash <laughs> come in on the side as well. So we're going to have to keep an eye exactly on how many stacks Hadrian gains and when his resets are and just how well the team peels and helps him peel because he will be locked to one of these islands during the static shot and accrue a ton of necrotic stacks in the meantime. Gulch Trotters now at 30% on Deep Beard as that snail ominously approaches the rest of the group. Yeah, I love what they were doing, and they actually held on to uh, their leg sweep to just before the static Nova went out, making sure that they were able to get the stun when uh, Hadron's kind of locked into that stand sandbar during the static Nova. Then once, uh, you know, the stun actually fades away, then the static Nova is over. He's able to start kiting, get a little bit of distance here. You're also seeing a great workout as Ironic to make sure that he's kiting those globules away and bringing them back into Hadrian as he inevitably will pull some kind of aggro from it. But he's doing well to make sure that they're all going to get dragged back into the tank in the process. Hadrian getting some excellent resets on his necrotic there, just now again reaching 10 stacks, but he's reset it a couple times there. Gulch Trotters at 4% on Deep Beer. They will be finishing up quickly along with that snail getting them to 92%, but a perfect amount of trash already accomplished over on Team Omega on the left side they have their 92 percent and as we said right after lady hey they can just barrage into those enchantresses zongo getting quite low there and procking his cheat death so that will not be available later in the fight yeah but also very important uh, to see you know what immunities that you're going to have available going into wrath of the shar here because they only have one uh battle res left available to them so it will take some time to be able to get the enchantresses down but it might also look like it they won't have they won't immediately have cheat death available for zongo so looking at what immunities you're gonna have available to them they will have bust and protection they will have divine shield available but at, from there they're gonna be looking at you know utilizing battle reses or maybe just using devotion or uh to be able to kind of reduce all the damage if they want to stack it up I, as as far as trash is concerned these teams are neck and neck they're done so at this point gulch trotters is ahead of the game they have the higher percentage in trash they're already working towards wrath of ashara and they still have that bloodlust available two deaths three deaths going down uh two deaths actually hadrian does hang on two deaths going down on team omega snipe they only have one battle res available and lady hate coil still has 18 percent that is disastrous at this point in the competition i don't know how they're going to recover from this one because gulch trotters is already slightly ahead of them they're just going to have to hope for a gulch trotters wipe here in order to catch up because trotters safely moving through each one of these enchantresses yeah they do an excellent job they're really making waves on this eye of ashara here getting through the third enchantress here as at this point it's the disaster scenario where you're just about to be finishing up a boss or you're 20 percent left on the boss you lose one dps you're not able to get them back up and it just takes such a long time to be able to get the boss down and be able to actually move on to this because you can't even touch the enchantresses until lady hate coil dies they're still channeling their lightning uh lighting fields so you're not even be able to touch them without dying here so you have to wait the entire boss fight then you're getting up fired up and then you're going to be able to move on so it's so much wasted time as Gulch Riders is finishing up the last enchantment yeah i mean team omega snap kind of had some solace in the fact that they had a four death difference between the team an extra 20 seconds on the board that's been shaved now down to 10 seconds they had to waste time rezzing of course the boss was slowly killed at the end for the last 20 percent only four manning it and Gulch Riders now has access on the big screen to wrath of ashara the final boss of the dungeon as bloodlust is immediately popped on the boss yeah, right here, you're seeing just the tight positioning uh, from the rest of the team while you, the tank is just kind of going off alone. That way, he'll be able to actually drop, of course, his AOE effect. Everybody will be able to quickly get out of it, and then you're going to be ha able to have the very first of the uh, soaks coming out. We're seeing Chomby getting hit by one of the tornadoes. He quickly gets battle rest here. You're seeing the Virtue going out on the side of Dag, getting everybody topped off with wings up, quickly soaking all of that, getting everybody topped off here. And from there, while they only they have no battle res left available, they still do have a uh, bust of protection, and Shape does have his uh, immunity and cheat death to be able to survive. Yeah, so hopefully they have a bit of luck with just who gets targeted with that split damage AOE. Otherwise, they will have to kind of sacrifice a member later and continue the map with four, uh, the map, the boss rather, with four people. So we'll have to see that. Uh, Team Omega Snipe still working on those enchantresses. Fair bit to go. Two of them left right now. So we'll have to keep an eye on how they do. Gulch Trotter is at 12% now on the boss. As this fight progresses, the kind of environment becomes more and more unstable. There's more storms, more tornadoes, and more waves that go out. And at 10%, which is technically 50% of the boss, he will kind of spawn and double the amount of storms and waves going on, making the environment a fair bit more hectic. Yeah, I mean, you're seeing there, Dag actually receiving the split damage effect, runs out of the group, make sure he's get, getting his divine shield up. So at this point, you're counting out to either go on to shape or you're going to be able to use Blessed Protection onto it. So they have a lot of time. They have a lot of uh, time and resources to be able to continue to survive this. 
Oh, Shape almost actually getting caught into that larger AOE off of his uh, death from above, so it's always very important to kind of watch the positioning as we're going into it here. But very good job, guys, at 7% at now on to Wrath of a Shard here. Keep in mind, the boss is only starting at 20% here, so they're still about halfway through the boss fight and getting very close. And they almost have another, another battle res available, so it should be no problem for them just to sacrifice Chompy or just uh, bop him right here. I mean, Shape and Texture's doing so much damage, too, off the bat. I'm pretty sure I saw Shape peak at 8, 8.5 mil, something like that, with that Bloodlust up. So huge amounts of damage coming up. Chompy getting that bop making sure to avoid these waves. I hope, as I say that, please don't make it look <laughs> bad. Excellent, moves out of the wave, and once it uh, gets dispelled for the Arcane Orb, safely moves out of the way. Wrath of Ashar now at 4% HP. They should be able to clean this up. Well, Wrath of Ashar has started over for Team Omega Snipe, 16% in just a moment on the board for them there, but I think it's just too little too late. They're gonna have 15 seconds to make up all that percentage on the boss. A, a huge disaster has to happen here for Gold Strutters for them to lose this game. Yeah, but they're having the final, of course, of the soaks going out here, making sure to getting everybody top off. This one's going to hurt a lot, but they do a great job to make sure they're playing extra defensive and getting everybody in together. I believe they actually just end up using their Devotion order to make sure they're kind of reducing a lot of the damage there, but it still was a pretty hectic hit as they're just getting that one battle res back. So it's good to be able to uh, get everybody stacked in together. 1% left now in a Wrath of Ashara as Gulch Trotters is primed to be able to take game one. I mean, you know, they caught up a bit, Team Omega Sniped at the end. They certainly had quite a lot of boss damage going into that, but that it was really just that cost on uh, on Lady Heiko at the end that maybe questionably, arguably could have cost them the game entirely. Um, that was a fair bit of time lost there. Yeah, it took it a lot of time. Around. Looks like uh, map choice is in. Gentlemen, take it away. Uh, no shock here, Jack, right? I mean, Team Omega Snipe thrives on this map. They love it. They've shown how dominant they could be on this map several times, so nothing to be really lost or expected here from them in that sense. Yeah, also on the other side, though, is Gulf Trotters looks like this is going to be, you know, this is a map that they're also no strangers to. So in many ways, when you're picking these maps, especially in the 23s, when there was such a high expectation that they would be very difficult to be able to watch out for, it puts so much emphasis on how well the execution is. As you're seeing on both sides, Dag and Luffy here doing a great job being able to just use their invisibility potions, using their best speed sets possible, proccing their Sefus, and being able to run upstairs into Agronox's room to be able to get that mass res onto the entire party. Sefus. <laughs> As they run up, Galstrader is just a bit slower approaching with the healer dag up the stairs, but nothing really to, to scoff at right now. No danger there. Does move safely across the patrol. Good timing there. Doesn't have to wait too long for it. Galstrader is just dealing with the rest of the trash. He, they don't kill Dual Zack. Usually they just finish off whatever trash they can and then just jump off the edge or get killed by the frontal wave. Little, uh, little time. Little oftentimes teams don't kill the boss is what i wanted to say but we actually do see him go down for team omega snipe part of the strategy here gulf strutters opts not to kill him as they jump off the side and wait for dag to get that mass res off yeah, it was interesting to see especially because we're in fortified quaking and bolstering here and while the game may not actually be decided yet we we're going to get back to it in just a moment so at this point when you're at fortified quaking and bolstering you know it, a lot of the emphasis does go on to making sure that you're able to avoid a lot of the bolstering on dulzac early like they did on the side of omega sniped as the, they're able to get uh, you know the rest of the uh, group down aha Twitch chat has been debated, but really we are actually <laughs> back alive in the match right now as both teams have been res uh, resed up to the upper portions of the map, dealing with the trash here before Agronox. Now, Jack, you know, you and I always talk about this. This is a great strategy, but it also lends itself to a lot of danger and instability. If any of the teams wipe here before Agronox dies, they will be ported back to the beginning of the dungeon. That is your only checkpoint right now. Yeah, and having those all-in strategies really has been such a focal point for the MDI, where they must be able to get past this point, really having the best execution possible here. When you're seeing, of course, the walker on the side of Gulch Trotters being, you know, very heavily bolstered, it's going to be very scary to actually take down because any time that any of the, uh, the casts are going out, he actually can just wipe the entire party if you're not careful. We, yeah, we are back in that bolstering, and it, it's quite dangerous for those at home. Of course, bolstering means that any time a trash mob dies, it will buff anything around it, including bosses, by 20% of their current health and 20% damage. So you want to make sure either to kill things alone, drag them far away enough, 40 to 50 yard range, I believe, for that bolster area, or kill things as evenly as possible. As Skylight gets down quite low, they're proccing the purgatory. We're just emphasizing how hard these mobs hit. Even though it shows that, that they have a sliver of health left, that health is actually a huge amount of raw HP just because the mass amount of bolster stacks they have. The tank is safely kiting around. Don't want to. It doesn't want to be touched again by that mob that has the potential to one-shot him right now. Yeah, it, it basically did from the purgatory frock where he was completely topped off and fine, and then just one hit from the walker just absolutely uh, proc him into purgatory and dropped him super low here. So very good kiting there on the side of Skylark. But that was you know the kind of the risky area where you're not giving enough respect really to bolstering and 
it almost can burn you, really. Right, Shard Jack, a flawless run so far from Team Omega Sniped, as we know them to do on this map. They have now pulled Agronox, resident tree boss of this dungeon. Jack, don't give me that face, please. They are ready to pull, and they have collected him to the middle area near the fountain, that kind of garden area, making sure that they filter in all of those fulminating lashers so that they can stun and slow them under the boss and cleave them down, whilst keeping an eye, of course, on that succulent lasher, which is particularly dangerous to the tank. A lot of damage coming out. Lumberjack, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> the succulent lasher, they do a great job being able to neutralize it very swiftly here. You do have to watch out for the small cast, which will leave those small felt pools behind. And then past that, you're again, it's just the single target damage that they can be uh, quickly pumping out. So very important, especially for melee, to make sure that uh, Hadron is going to be able to quickly pick it up. Make sure you're not having any extra problems there. And then rotating through stuns or grips to be make sure that they're always able to interrupt uh, any of the void zones that the succulent lasher might put down. And of course, for those at home, just a small issue, of course, here in the UI. But we are keeping track of everything in the back. It will all be accurately displayed played at the end for now we can appreciate the beauty of the dungeon and the players playing it and of course our lovely voices jack <laughs> gulch trotters at 38 percent on agronox whilst 21 percent for team omega sniped on the big screen here should be easily able to finish this off as they have dealt with the second round of fulminating lashers second one lashers being well tended to punted away from hadrian don't want to accrue any extra damage on him slowing it stunning it and just moving away from any of the residue that it leaves under the ground excellent performance by them here they just do this boss so well we're gonna have to examine this under a p2 dish <laughs> Great job by Omega Snipe taking down, of course, Agronox there. And they're a little bit ahead in terms of trash percentage, which is always important to note, uh, because they did take down Dual Zack uh, at the very bottom level of the floor there. So... Uh, in, in the past, we've actually seen some teams who have focused down dual Zack have actually worked onto it, and it gives them a little bit of breathing room when they're going to be taking on a lot of the imps that will try to escape through the portal right after Thrash Fight. Uh, and we've seen a couple teams in the past who, oh, maybe they miss one or two imps, and it actually sets them really far behind because they are anticipating being able to have perfect trash percentage. But that dual Zack kill gives them a little bit of breathing room, especially when you have to worry about some of the uh, hyper-bolstered imps running away into the portal there. And that's just the big deal here. I mean, it's already tough enough to kind of make sure that pull goes excellent. You kill all of the mobs too, but the bolstering just makes it so difficult. It means that everybody on the team has to be so accurate about DPSing everything evenly, because if you get one mob that's too high with that bolster, it's going to get out of hand quite quickly. Yeah, but you're seeing here they're doing a great job focusing down any the botanists, because ideally they want to make sure they're interrupting that blistering rain, which they d just did. But previously, when they actually let it go through, that was actually what proxed Zongo's cheat death there and actually dropped people incredibly low here. So that was what really got uh, Luffy to start popping his Holy Avenger to make sure he's able to get everybody uh, swiftly topped off while still bumping out a little bit of extra damage onto the side. They did pull that Temptress, I believe it might have been on accident, so they really need to like, target swap immediately to start working its way down. Otherwise, the Temptress is going to have so much HP, and while it won't be pr super deadly to the entire group in the same way that maybe the Botanist would be, having the Walker dealing so much damage and as well as the Temptress just having so much HP, it just takes such a long time and just wastes so much time to be able to get through the instance and kill it. Yeah, but they seem to not care as they do get that botanist down and opt to use the, okay, the uh, they strategy. opt to use the death strategy, the infamous death strategy, the one-two death. Um, now, of course, one of the AOE stomps did go off there from the walker, if I'm not mistaken, right after that bolster stack too, so that was just a lethal amount of damage. Could have been planned though, they could have said, look, this is going to take way too long to DPS, let's just eat the death, get that botanist down, which you can see they put a skull on and crank the damage on before they opted to die. So it could have been all been planned after having made that mistake and pulling what they quite frankly didn't intend to pull. We have seen them do this map a few times. Big pull coming up here for Team Omega Sniped in this room, which we've seen them do flawlessly a few times already. Gulch Trotters already at 43% in the same room. They're kind of just planning out their route right now, getting ready to pull, waiting for an optimal patrol from the sides to get everything together. Yeah, really at this point, they're just the preparation to make sure, as we've seen out of Hadron in the past, grabbing everything in together, making sure he's able to get the fellow imps, as well as just grabbing everything without Gazer Axe here. Very important to be able to get everything in together because the health pools are fairly even enough to be able to swiftly burn down uh, throughout just the, the quick stun timers that you're going to be seeing here. They also do a good job making sure they're getting that banish out to it, not only proc Sefus, but make sure that any higher health mobs are not going to actually be bolstered too heavily. Very important to watch out for these heavily bolstered fellow imps. Any of the casts going off onto Hadron would just be extremely lethal there so great job there but they also had to make sure they skipped some of those scavengers onto the side there because they would just take a little bit too long for the patrol to actually work out the way that they wanted it to so now they can also just deal with the scavengers who have quite a bit more hp than most of the imps do and be able to swiftly take them down gulch charter is actually having a bit of difficulty with what you just mentioned they did buff some of these scavengers just a bit too much as you can see uh we have skylar kind of frantically running around the sides making sure he doesn't get too many hits from these super bolstered worm tug scavengers everyone's helping kite and peel right now 
as they destroy the last couple of pixels and sliver of their health. A few books have gone down, a couple more bolstering, but you can, of course, CC those books that go down the Arcane Monstrosity Tomes. Uh, right here on the side, you can either stun them or fear them to make sure that it stops their cast as we see that fear come up from Zyronic. Well done by him, making sure that it doesn't spawn that Arcane Sentry that just takes an absolute just huge amount of time to chew through. Gazerax finally has been pulled from Team Omega Sniped. Yeah, the Arcee technique going down once again on the side of Gulf Striders here. They're getting him, uh, looks like they are actually uh, burning the battle res to be able to get him up very quickly here. They're gonna be able to go, actually no, they just waited to get the regular res out on him before they went up to pull Gazerax. Very important, Gazerax is gonna be the last uh, trash mob you have to pull before you are able to activate Thrash Bite. So at this point, you wanna make sure that you're not only able to separate him from most of the mobs and prevent any kind of bolstering, but as you're seeing here, they're waiting until Gazerax is already more than half HP uh, before they're pulling any of the extra imps. That way, Zongo is going to be able to get some extra damage into Gazerax while slowly burning down the rest of those mobs. Y you know, this pull always kind of makes me a bit worried for Team Omega Snipe under this bolstering environment. If they accidentally kill any of those imps or scavengers a bit too early from Gazerax, he'll bolster and likely kill some of them as Luffy and Z uh, Luffy goes down. Zyronic gets down to 2%, barely hangs on. Zongo does proc his cheat death. It's a bit of a mess right now. They don't want to have the full wipe as the boss goes down. Battle Res has gone down and been used on Luffy to make sure that they don't have a full wipe when these mobs are already so low HP. Gulch Trotters has already now pulled Thrash Bite with 65% on the board. This really was kind of the turning point for uh, Gulch Trotters to start pulling ahead is while they did actually have to worry about some of those heavily bolstered scavengers, they just executed much better onto Gazerax and they didn't incur any of those extra deaths. They didn't have those extra deaths on, say, the Walkers uh, right after Agronox there. So great work here by Gulch Trotters to keep things cleaner and actually have a stronger execution than Omega Snipes in this room. It's just so scary to pull extra trash with Gazerax, who's already so dangerous on top of bolstering, and this time it didn't pay off for Team Omega Snipe. Yesterday we saw them do it flawlessly, so a bit sloppier here for them this time. We see the charge go off on Chompy, who has, of course, has been bopped by Dag so that they don't shatter any of the bookcases, needing to deal with any of those arcane tomes, and then needing to, of course, book it right out of the boss's AoE. <laughs> book it indeed, as you see, is ironic. Also, similarly, getting bopped to be able to make sure he's avoiding uh, the charge. If Thrash Bite does end up charging through uh, to one of the players, uh, if you do not have a bop or an immunity, you will just run back into one of those bookcases where it'll smash the bookcase and spawn a couple of the arcane tomes, which can actually just have uh, any number of different casts going out from slows to mind controls. That can be such a pain to actually deal with here, especially because he will just smash the ground immediately afterwards. So having a combination of a slow with a ground smash can be quite lethal. Gulch Trotter is now putting the final chapter on the story of Thrash Bite as he falls over. They get ready to move into the next room, into this massive imp pull here. Now, this is one of the most difficult pulls in this dungeon, especially in this bolstering scenario. You're going to see the AOE group coming, and then as much CC as possible. First, we have the leg sweep. We're going to see likely a typhoon. There it is. Wanting to make sure that they chisel down as many of these mobs evenly as possible before they escape through the imp portal at the top of the stairs into the back of the room coming up. Now, the issue here, of course, is bolstering. We're seeing another repetition of it on Team Omega Snipe with the Bloodlust being popped here. They don't want to take any chances. Gulch Charter's doing well, but they do have some really bolstered scavengers right now. Skylar proccing that purgatory and running for his life up the stairs as the rest of the team helps peel. Yeah, at that point, it is very important to pull on the side of a Mega Snipe here. The kind of turning point they need to be able to get back into this because they didn't actually have any sort of banishes that, like, say, Zoronic would be able to have to deal with those scavengers here uh, and make sure that they're not going to be able to receive any extra bolstering stacks. But at this point, they're kind of just having to kite for their lives on the side of Gulch Trotters to make sure they're able to burn that HP. And as you said earlier, even though it may look like they have a sliver left, they're just bolstered so many times. It's a huge chunk of health. And they have to be really careful because they're running out of space here as they get up to the spider area, but also there's tomes spawning downstairs. They have to keep an eye on those books and make sure that they interrupt them if one of the arcane and uh, monstrosity tomes spawn. Team Omega Snipe has kind of made up some time here with their superior pull. Of course, it did cost them their bloodlust. They did opt to use it. Now they're moving up with their 90%. We'll be skipping past these enforcers that don't give percent, getting ready under the correct circumstances once the orb caster passes just a bit away, getting some CC on it in just a moment as they reach the far side of the room to make sure that it does not patrol back into Nalasha, which they'll soon pull. Yeah, and right here you're seeing, you know, Gulch, or sorry, Omega Sniped in many ways is trying to maximize their bloodlust timing so well, and but it also comes with some certain risks and some certain, uh, I, I guess that you could best say, assumptions as to where they're going to be. They're always assuming that it's going to take them another eight and a half minutes to be able to kill not only Nalasha, but then you can be able to go on to the third boss and finally you know, about halfway through the fourth boss or maybe after the first transition phase of Mephistroth, they'll be able to get bloodlust back to them. So 
it is kind of a risk that they're at, kind of hedging their bets that they're going to be able to have it. Whereas Gulch Trotters is saying, we're going to be able to go so much more quickly that we'll be able to immediately have it on Mephistroth and be able to burn it just a little bit faster. And, you know, we mention every time these Spiderlings are really dangerous for the tank. They stack that poison on the tank. There are a couple of dispels available on either side, so they have a bit of support from that, I believe, in favor of the Gulch Trotters side. They have slightly more dispels, but you don't want to get too many stacks. As soon as Nalasha dies, you can already see that both tanks are kind of playing it more defensively, running away right away from the Spiderlings helping Peel, dropping some slows, and Zongo does go down on Team Omega Sniped right now. They opt to use the battle res right away to help finish off these spiders as Hadrian kind of runs for his life to the corners of the room, making sure he doesn't get too much of that damage, including the bolstered stacks that are on these spiders on top of the poison, so playing it safe. Yeah, as you're seeing, uh, Skylark is going down on the side of Gulch Trotters here. They are, do you end up just kind of having everybody die towards uh, any of those spiders there? And you are seeing, of course, the failure detection pylon going down, so the spiders will just despawn, uh, of course, because they don't actually give any extra trash percentage here, so Dag doing well to be able to run upstairs, start the RP event, and then get the res out. But great moves by Hadran to make sure he's getting away from the spiders as best as he can because Luffy actually ran upstairs similar to, similar to how Dag did, started the RP event and was not available to provide any of the spells for Hadran. So at that point, they're just leaning on fired up to get any poison spells off of Hadran as he just kind of kited for his life. And, you know, for Gulch Trotters, we have seen this tactic often where you just say, you know what, screw it. We'll just get a wipe here. The spiders will despawn, no problem. But they kind of half killed them and then started running up the stairs and then things started going sour and then they opted to go for the wipe so cost them a bit of extra time there and we're pretty even on the board now trash is essentially done for both groups as you will have the four bats after uh Dama tracks here in just a moment and you know the trash percentage equal the deaths are now equal the only difference between the two is two battle reses available for gulch trotters but Dama tracks has been started on both sides spawning the two portals at 90 percent and then of course another two at 50 percent yeah but you've seen the team on omega snipe is dodging that chaotic energy defending against it by standing in the aegis in the center of the room you will of course have have those two different transition phases like you mentioned which uh, Omega Sight is quickly approaching here. And a lot of times you will see that the greater risk might be taken where they say we're going to keep on pushing to 50% here even though we'll have to deal with the chaotic energy about halfway through the phase here or they might just try to stop DPS and get as close as they can to 50% wait for the chaotic energy and then start the transition phase but when you're in this much of a race you have to just be able to take those extra risks here as you're seeing of course the second phase starting i mean neck and neck right here only a few percent separating these two teams now the two more dangerous portal uh, portal spawn i'm fired up does go down they don't have the battle res available to them an advantage that unfortunately only gulch trotters has they're going to have to four man the rest of this boss right now 41 percent worth desperately trying to kill the portal guardians as to not spawn the stronger fell lord elemental Make sure to banish the mistress on the side and, of course, deal with the other mistress. You don't want to have them AOE cleaving you while you're hiding in the middle of that Aegis. It looks like he just wasn't able to get into the Aegis in time to be able to you know, defend against the chaotic energy. But it also was just a very odd position uh, with the rest of the team where they kind of had just gotten to maximum energy onto the boss, onto Domatrax, right as the transition was starting there. Zongo, of course, is staying out and dropping very, very low to be, or actually getting back in dropping very low from that chaotic energy, but very important to be able to make sure they're still kiting away and still bringing uh, those mistresses away from the rest of the group. But it's kind of a scary position like we've said in the past, having to deal with these boss fights with no battle res left available to them and so much HP remaining. Yeah, I mean, we're just kind of in a, in a similar situation to what we saw in the last map on IFS Shar. The both teams are very close right now, but Gulch Trotters has a slight advantage in deaths. They have two battle reses and they have their bloodlust available for Mephistroth. As Domatrax does finally fall, they'll be rounding up these four Dreadwings, making sure to kite them around the area. And once uh, they're done with that, they'll have access to the final boss. It really seems very similar to Eye of where, like you said, where just that one death in the boss fight or just a couple deaths here and there really makes it so much uh, harder for them to be able to kind of catch up. I mean, the Omega Snipe was about 20%, 15% ahead in terms of boss damage going into it. They pulled the boss much earlier, and then uh, Gulch Trotters is able to catch back up, already taking all the trash down. They're right about to hit Mephistroth, and like you said, they have Bloodless back. They have Bloodlust back. We did see Shape, uh, Shape Rogue's uh, cheap death proc there. He just kind of got clipped by the bats in front and some of the AoE on the ground. Could have been either one of them. Didn't catch an eye on that, but he does not have the cheat death available for this fight coming up. Mephistroth does spawn for Gulch Trotters, who pull immediately, expecting to see that Bloodlust in just a moment. There it goes. We do have 40 seconds of this first phase before Mephistroth hides into the shadows for his second phase, so they're going to get a nice full Bloodlust out of this. Chompy doing well to move to the side and spawn those pillars on the side away from the dominant melee 
uh, the melee weighted group rather that they have and uh, not causing any danger to them in that regard. Yep, and especially for both groups, uh, both groups only have one real range player. Ideally, the, the pillars will be spawning onto range or preferring the range players, but because both Holy Paladins are counted as a melee, it's going to go on to Champions, Ironic, respectively, and then going to be going on to a random melee or healer that's going to be right there. So at that point, you have a little bit of a sacrifice in terms of damage if you're going to have one of your DPSers forced to run out every single time. Uh, you have to be making sure they're keeping it out, outside of the rest of the group here, but it should be something that they're both well prepared for. Skylar putting up his shield, making sure to defend Illidan in the middle of the room for those big purple evil balls that come from the images of Mephistroth, which randomly spawn around the room. It's up to the DPS players to make sure that they eliminate as many of those images as possible as to make Skylar's job easier and not get Illidan hit by the balls. Should he get hit, this phase that has increasing damage to the group will extend an extra four or five seconds, if I'm not mistaken, Jack. Illidan, unfortunately, does take one to the chin there, and we will have to deal with the phase a bit longer. Dag doing well to pop his bubble and intercept one of those balls, helping Skylar out in the middle. Meantime, on the left side, we see Team Omega Sniped in a similar situation. Yeah, they're doing well to make sure they're getting out of that phase. Uh, Gulch Trotters here at 50% left onto Mephistroth, right as Omega Sniped is also leading through it. So at this point, even with Bloodlust already popped, Gulch Trotters isn't super far ahead. It's not as far ahead as I thought they initially would have been. Uh, so at this point, uh, it really is going to be uh, that DPS race onto it because there is going to be the exact same amount of deaths going out. Shape is going down. They do have the battle res left available to them. And this is, might be like one of the little openings that they have because, like you said, they already burned the, uh, the cheat death there. They, they burn the cheat death, but the only problem is that actually ties them at a deaths right now. So in terms of raw percentage, Gulf Trotters is still ahead by about 10%. I, I mean, you're going to have to hope for another death or a wipe for Team Omega Sniped for their life in the remainder of this tournament. Mephistroth putting out his second set of pillars right now, dropping to single digits of percent. DPS getting quite low. Tech going down. They do have the battle res available. An extra five seconds on the clock for Team Omega Sniped as they're rifling down through the boss's health, getting to the 10% mark as well. And five seconds on the clock for them, but I just don't think it's going to be enough at this point. And Gulf Striders with two seconds left, one, and Gulf Striders will take it with 2% left on the boss for Omega Snipe, just a little bit Oof. behind. As Gulf Striders takes it. Oof. This series, wow. uh, this was an incredibly close series between these two teams. That is right, Robin. I'm here with Tech, and we start off the day first day of eliminations in our tournament and on top of that I don't even think you know yet but it came down to four seconds it was a very very close series there and I just want to ask you yesterday you have a pretty rough day you get 2-0 now you come out here and you grab the 2-0 so what's going through your mind yeah obviously a lot of uh, a lot of nerves and a lot of disappointment from yesterday um, it was very unfortunate I think um, you know we we had the practice and and we were prepared for yesterday but we just didn't pull it off on the day and Charles were the better team on the day so kudos to them they've been playing fantastically um, today, you know, we came in, we just wanted to play our game, make sure we put yesterday behind us and get the job done, which we did, so I'm really happy. Now, the MDI in general, it's a very new thing, and what you're saying takes a lot of composure, and I, I know that you have a bunch of experience, you've actually competed before in the past. Is that something that you actually have to bring to the squad to help them gain composure, come out and just play the day's match? Yeah, I think, I think previous experience definitely helps. Um, I think between me and Dag, um, on the team who, who helps me with that as well. We have a lot of composure in the team to sort of maintain that and I think that's helped us a lot to get through so far and obviously the lower bracket and the regionals as well. Yeah, and also you, you got a little bit of an age difference on your team as well. You're kind of the old man of the team. Do you have to take that role quite a bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, Dag's very mature as well, so he sort of steps up to the old man role um, with me. But yeah, we have two youngsters, 19-year-olds um, on the team, so, you know, keeping them in line can often be difficult. But no, they're fantastic players, and it's been a great experience to sort of mesh together with all the different ages and work together as a team. All right, so the squad's definitely got a little bit of everything. The first elimination match going to go their way as well, but I'm going to kick it back up to you guys on the desk.